This episode is brought to you by Cisco Educational Premium. Epoch of the universe known as the Planck Epoch occurred at 10 raised to negative 43 seconds. During this time, it is believed that all the fundamental forces, including electromagnetism, the weak force, the strong force, were unified as one grand unified force at this point. However, it is important to note that this isn't exactly t is equal to 1 as we, we want to avoid the singularity. The state of the universe at this epoch and what happened before it remained unknown. The earliest time we can theorize about is the period of inflation which occurred from about 10 raised to negative 36 seconds to about 10 raised to negative 33 seconds after the Big Bang. During this time, whatever existed prior to inflation experienced rapid exponential expansion, faster than the speed of light. This is allowed because there is no theoretical restriction on the speed at which space itself can expand. It expanded from a point to a point about the size of a baseball. You might wonder how this is even possible since we know that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. While this is true for information transfer, cosmic inflation involves the expansion of space itself, allowing distant points to move away from each other faster than light can travel between them. Most of our current understanding comes from the period after inflation. So, the accurate way to view the Big Bang is not as a single point of origin, but as a period when the early universe was extremely hot, dense, and rapidly expanding. Thus, the Big Bang is a description of everything that occurred after T is equal to 1. Inflation is believed to have occurred from 10 raised to negative 36 to 10 raised to negative 3 seconds. The energy source behind this rapid expansion and cosmic inflation erased any information about what existed before it. The theory of the standard model of cosmology is well understood, starting at about 10 raised to negative 12 seconds, as the universe's energy levels can be reduced in current particle accelerators. Before this time, we can only speculate about the events. From about 10 raised to negative 3 seconds to 10 raised to 12 seconds, strong force and electromagnetic and weak forces, collectively known as electro weak force, was still unified. The origin of the initial massless fundamental particles is uncertain. They might have condensed from the energies present during the Big Bang or an inflation field containing inflations could have decayed into the fundamental particles we observe today. Around 10 raised to negative 11 seconds, the temperature drops further to 10 raised to 15 Kelvin, marking the beginning of the quark epoch. The electromagnetic and weak forces begin to separate, leading to electroweak symmetry breaking. The X fields gain uh, and zero potential, imparting mass to the fundamental particles of the standard model. At this point, the essential components of atoms are in place, and the universe temperature is around 1 quadrillion Kelvin. As the universe continues to expand and cool, the extremely high temperatures present prevent quarks from combining into hadrons like protons and neutrons. However, as temperature drops to about 1 trillion Kelvin at 10 raised to negative 5 seconds, the quark plasma transitions into a hadron gas consisting of protons, neutrons and certain mesons, which eventually decay into photons and electrons. As the temperature further decreases, particles and antiparticles begin to annihilate, resulting in lighter particle and antiparticle pairs, such as neutrinos and photons. Interestingly, there is a slight asymmetry in this process, which 
with the more particles being generated than antiparticle leading to the survival of certain quarks and electrons. This enables the formation of protons, neutrons and electrons which are essential for creating the initial atoms. The annihilation process culminates with the Lipton epoch which occurs around one second mark when the temperature subsides to about 5 billion Kelvin. During this epoch, leptons conclude the annihilation process. Following this remarkable display, the majority of the matter particles transforms into photons and neutrinos. However, due to the matter and time asymmetry, a small quantity of protons, neutrons, and electrons remain surviving as the fundamental building blocks for atoms. At around a few minutes after the universe inception, the epoch of the Big Bang nucleosynthesis, PBN, begins with protons and neutrons produced in equal numbers. Free neutrons are inherently unstable and undergo better decay, transforming into protons over approximately 10 raised to 50 minutes. As the temperature remains high, proton neutron conversion is balanced by neutron proton conversion but as the inverse cools further neutron decay becomes more prevalent free neutrons strive to join other hadrons and form more extensive nuclei before decay leading to the universe consisting of about 75 percent hydrogen nuclei and 25 percent helium-4 nuclei along with small amounts of deuterium helium-3 and trace quantities of, of lithium-9 nuclei. In this period, the environment predominantly consisting of ionized nuclei without bound electrons. The formation of neutral atoms requires electrons to attach to positively charged nucleons to achieve charge balance. However, the universe is still scorching and electrons can only briefly adhere to nucleons before being forcibly separated due to their immense energy. As a result, the universe remains opaque and photons carrying light continuously interact with nucleons and electrons, hindering their free propagation through space. This photon epoch lasts for about 380,000 years until the universe cools down to 3,000 Kelvin. At this point, electrons possess significantly reduced energy, allowing the electromagnetic force to permanently bind them to nucleons, leading to the formation of stable neutral atoms in a process called recombination. As a consequence, Photons are no longer confined amidst the chaos of positive nucleons and negative electrons. They are now free to traverse the universe. Even if Sava was present in space, he or she would be able to observe this light. Today, the first light of the universe, known as the cosmic microwave background (CMB), can be perceived in all directions. This light was emitted during the formation of fastable neutral atoms, providing us with valuable insights into the early universe and the origin of atoms. Atoms constantly interact. However, to comprehend this, we must first determine the definition of interact. Our typical understanding of interaction is based on the macroscopic world. I place my palm on the chair. My palm interacts with the chair. You step on the floor, you interact with the floor, and so forth. In these instances, one solid boundary or service interacts with another solid boundary or service. Nevertheless, our macroscopic understanding becomes less applicable at a microscopic level, which leads to confusion about interaction. If we could magnify the scale to atomic level, we would witness a chaotic envisionment. This episode is brought to you by Cisco Educational Premium. 
For ages, it has been said that mathematics is the mother of all sciences. All the concepts of science stem from mathematics. This alma mater, the nourishing mother, mathematics is truly astounding. And what better concept to demonstrate this than the bar of light as a consequence of solving Maxwell's equations. Maxwell's equations are four in number. The first is the Gauss law for electricity, which relates the net electric flux to the net enclosed charge. The second is the Gauss law for magnetism, which relates net magnetic flux to the net enclosed charge. The third is the Faraday's law, which relates induced electric field to the changing magnetic flux. And the last but not the least is the Ampere Maxwell law, which relates induced magnetic field to the changing electric flux and to the current. But wait, 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 Caleb. What they call Maxwell's equation again? That's a story for another day. Now, the real deal. This is a man's show. You're not going to just make sense of statements, but crucially piece together reality from numbers, from mathematics. No shortcuts. These are Maxwell's equations in their differential form. In a vacuum, when there are no electric charges and currents, our Maxwell's equations will evolve to a shown. Our equations are now simpler. The first and the second equations are the divergence of electric and magnetic fields. These two are telling us that if there are no charges present to create magnetic and electric field lines or terminate them, there will be no divergence. The fields will be continuous. They will not start or end. Astonishingly, Maxwell's equations, even in completely empty space, can define and allow the existence of magnetic and electric fields. The other two equations deals with how these continuous electric and magnetic fields behave. The third tells us that the electric field can be created by firing of magnetic fields in the vicinity. Same as the third, the fourth equation tells us that we can get some magnetic fields in the vicinity by firing some magnetic fields. Both of these fields must be at right angles to one another for one of these fields to generate the other. Say in the third equation as shown, remember mathematically, the left hand side of this equation, del cross E, we are taking the curl of this, we are taking the cross product. Any factors within the cross product will always be completely at right angles to the resultant factors which in our case is the magnetic field. So if the electric fields points anywhere in the xy plane, the, mag the magnetic fields must be at right angles to it. The same thing goes for the fourth equation. Any change in the, in the electric field causes new magnetic field at right angle to the electric field. Remember, we are solving Maxwell's equations. Now I want to find electric and magnetic fields formulas. Say so that when we substitute the left hand side, it will match the right hand side of these equations. We want the third and second equations, remember. We can't get information about electric field without knowing the value of the magnetic field. And we can't get any information about the magnetic field if we do not know the value of the electric field. So what gives? These equations seem to be conjoined and tangled, so to speak. In math talk, we can say that it is a first order couple differential equation. What we want to do is to decouple these equations so that they will be completely separate equations. A separate equation for E and a completely separate equation for B decoupling them so to speak now let us start with the 
for the equation. Let us take the curl of both sides of this equation and so we get as shown. On the left side, let us use the factor identity so we get as shown. On the right hand side, let us exchange the order of the derivatives. Now replacing del cross E using the third Maxwell's law, we get as shown. Now combining everything, if you didn't notice, we have successfully decoupled the two equations into a second order linear partial differential equation. Just to review, the left hand side is Laplace an operator, del square B, which is a factor 2, same as the right hand side, ignoring mu not and epsilon not. We have a shown. And so since both sides are factor quantities, the x component of the left hand side must match that on the right hand side. The y components must match too. Same goes for z. Just to remember, we are now finding the solutions to the second order decoupled differential equation. As we had seen, these really three separate equations. One for x, one for y, and one for z. Now we are going to try some functions on how they will solve our equations. Now that we are trying trial solutions for the x component, which is just the same for the y component, and so for the z component. Now I want to look for a function f that might obey the equation as shown. Could alpha just a constant? Say partial sub t square f was just proportional to the original f and similarly for partial x square f we want to look for a function whose second derivative is equivalent to the original function apart from e to the x so to say hmm can you remember any yes any cosine or sine function fit here partial t square cos t is equivalent to negative cos t we are going to allow for f to have both an amplitude and frequency. f is equivalent to a cos omega t, where we have omega to be the angular frequency in radians per second. So if we have partial x square bx to be as shown, and if both partial x square bx and partial t square bx are proportional to bx, then we are on the right track. We know that Partial x square a cos omega t is equivalent to zero. So we need to add some special dependence, some x so to speak. We are going to propose an answer, a trial solution so to speak. For those who took differential equations classes, I know this word, answer, when on top of our heads. It's just an example solution, a trial solution. The product of a function that depends only on space times a different function that depends only on time. Looks like the good old chain rule is in our favor. If partial x square fx is, is proportional to fx and partial t square gt is proportional to gt. That is, there are sine and cosines. Then we have partial x square bx as shown. Also, partial t square bx as shown. And so we see that partial x square bx is proportional to partial t square bx, which is exactly what we need. Now, let us consider these two functions, our separable solutions. f is the frequency that is waves per seconds. K is the number of waves per meter. You can think of K as the spatial frequency analogous to Ft, which is the time frequency. Now, calculating the derivatives of our two functions, we have partial x square fx and partial t square gt as shown. 
And so if a magnetic field is expressed as BX XT as shown, provided by our answers, then we have partial X square BX and partial T square BX as shown. But let's just check. Our guess BX XT is as shown with partial X square BX to be as shown. So it's okay. And so now we need to ask ourselves, does this obey the second order linear partial differential equation resulting from Maxwell's equations? Is partial x square bx as shown? Now replacing partial x square bx and partial t square bx with expressions as shown, but the left must match the right. So cancelling terms we get as shown. And so the question we need to ask, does our ratio match the actual numbers of mu naught, epsilon naught and the units? Then those are the exact function that are gonna solve Maxwell's equations. Now let us just look at the units of the ratio. F on K as shown. This means that our f on k represents a velocity. Isn't it incredible? And so letting f on k be equivalent to v, then our equation will be satisfied when f on k square is equivalent to v square, which is equivalent to 1 on mu naught epsilon naught. Then what is the exact value of v? You know that mu naught is the permeability of free space, a magnetic constant, and it has a defined value. And epsilon naught is a dielectric permittivity of free space. And it too has a determined value. And so we are able to find the value of V. And we find it to be 2.998 times 10 raised to 8 meters per second. Which is what? Which is the speed of light. This is the solution to the Maxwell's equations. The speed of light is the solution the Maxwell's equations. The only solutions to Maxwell's equations have the property that they propagate at the speed of light, which are combination of magnetic fields and electric fields orthogonal to one another, carrying with them energy at that specific velocity, which is the speed of light or any electromagnetic radiation specifically. It is not the only light that travels at that speed. All electromagnetic radiation specifically and so james clark maxwell created light at least mathematically whether this was just a coincidence or a deliberate attempt it doesn't matter what matters is that it is correct the square educational premium is a section of the square educationals with content that is not hosted here. There are episodes ranging from long to short videos. Remember those good old shots of ours? They are there. So how do we get there? Use the link on screen or in the description or in the pinned comment below. Enjoy yourself. And I will see you in the next episode of Cisco Educationals. Yeah.